What happens when two bass road warriors spend quality time talking music and life with one of their peers? Bassist educator author David C. Gross and bassist and head honcho of KnowYourBassPlayer.com, Tom Semioli, trade eights with the legends of rock, jazz, funk, blues, folk, country, and more. Notes from an artist. Revealing conversations with the legends who've created the soundtrack of our lives. What happens? You're about to find out. It's another episode of Notes from an Artist. Welcome back, our audience member, for the continuing saga of Matt Laval. This is part two of our conversation with Matt, who is an avant-garde band leader, composer, collaborator, performing artist. Fascinating stuff. Yes, David? Just really fascinating. But what I find even more fascinating, Tom, Yes. what radio podcast hosts do you know that have done Ron Carter, Larry Grenadier, Bill Wyman, all on the same podcast? Well, on the same radio show, David. Well, that would be those two guys from Notes from an Artist. Pretty amazing. You would think we would have won the Flying Fickle Finger of Fate Award by now, but perhaps Absolutely. Not. Absolutely. Right. But I think part of this is due to the fact that musicians love to talk about themselves, including you and I. Yes, and we should talk about ourselves more, David. But fascinating stuff. Matt Laval, part two, our conversation with Matt Laval. One of the reasons I doubled down with it is I brought I brought it to Ornette. I said, let's see what he says about this. Because Ornette was very hard on my bass clarinet. He did not like it at all. And he really, to the point of, in the middle of a session one time, uh, he stopped the music, he stopped us from playing, and he said, give me that. I, I was playing bass clarinet, and he said, give me that. So I handed him the bass clarinet, and he took it, and he, and, uh, he let left the room and he put it on the couch outside the music room and he came back in the room and then he picked up my trumpet and he handed it to me and he said this is your horn i was like that's hardcore that's hardcore. <laughs> that's serious coming from one of the architects of the music just told me that that i was adrift that this right, bass clarinet thing was i had been led astray by my own creative impulses and that really that was like a gut punch right there sure. i never yeah. i never i never brought the bass clarinet back to his house but a few months later i was i decided to take a chance and i showed up with the alto i was like well what's he gonna think about this well i was like well i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna see what happens i'm gonna see what he now he was into the alto and i can't tell you why because i don't know but we played free we played like a free duet and i was like so what do you th- so so what do you think and he said he said oh you're on to something with that he goes he uh it, that that's all he said is you're really on to something with that keep go- keep going keep developing that so I got like the sanction could be while. that his whole thing was I've heard people on bass clarinet this that and the other thing and when you brought the alto in since as you say no one really is playing it that could have been th- the impetus for him to to say that yeah it it also that and it also has something to do with the way he perceives he perceives everything as I everything musically as ideas and if you do so if you play in a way that he doesn't he doesn't process as ideas it doesn't work for him like uh one day i decided one day i didn't know what to do so i decided to do like this johnny hodges glissando like he does on a ballad almost like the length of a fifth like i thought this was some impressive shit i was like oh check this out man i'm gonna well okay or i'm oh it's on that coma i'm gonna i'm gonna do this and this will probably be cool and he was like he it, it, it actually frustrated him and actually seemed to annoy him on some level. And then he and he he got like he he was kind of like he got like kind of like agitated. And then he said he he went back to this thing about ideas. He's like if if you if you play something that's not a, a cohesive musical idea, then, then what are you doing? So I was like, okay. Yeah, so that, that that's the thing. That's the, that, that a lot of the things about Arnett is the people that totally misread or missed the boat on what he what he was actually doing was was not what a lot of people think he was doing. Mm. He was methodical and uh, and scientific and drilling down on a lot of very specific things in the outside uh, realm. I was in a Facebook thread, the, a Facebook discussion the other day, and someone brought up the the idea about the rules of free play. Like, what's that about? If you're playing. Free free there shouldn't be any rules but there actually is a lot of rules <laughs> and a lot of people want to play free but they still want certain things to be a certain way you can't do this you shouldn't do this you can't do that i've met a lot of musicians like that they're under the banner the category of, of free jazz but that's probably where they end up by default but they have their own book of standards and rules about the way things should work. I've encountered this a lot. I've done extensive sideman work. I'm I'm 53. 
So I've done a lot of sideman work over the years. I've been uh, in situations where I'll do something and, and I've been just straight up told, don't do that. At least this is like in a free uh, free jazz situation. But like, no, no, don't, don't, don't do that. Everybody has what they what they like and what they, everybody gravitates towards the way they really feel the music should flow. You know, and we all end up in, in getting categorized in one way or another. Th th this this record that's coming out, Harmelotic Duke, is uh, I, I'm really especially intrigued by uh, this one because I took what I learned from Harmelotic Monk and spent a lot more years developing everything all, all, all outside around it. And then to apply it to Duke at, at first would say, heresy, how dare you? How dare you do Harmelotic, a Harmelotic approach to Duke Ellington? I mean, when Marsalis could send the, the, the police, Jazz at Lincoln Center, I should be arrested. I should be I should be arrested and I should be held in a jail at Lincoln Center. For hey, Matt, we have a word like for it. this. <laughs> we call it the Wintonization of music. Unless you're wearing a suit and you're doing Art Blakey shit. Look what he did with Ken Burns. Tom and I were talking about this. We've done Cisco shows. Bradley. Several shows on this about Witten being the chief of jazz police and the problem with it. And, I, and this ties into what you're doing with your blog, not your blog, your your um, podcast. I want to I wanted to get to. Yes, David and I have said this, that, uh, you know, Ken Burns jazz was basically should have been titled uh, what Witten Martha Salas thinks jazz should be. And he really he, he really just discounted the 60s and all the experimental stuff, the jazz fusion stuff that David and I grew up on. And unfortunately, what happens is these guys, their word is taken as gospel. They're, they're, they're uh, tools of the establishment, obviously, because establishment doesn't want music that challenges you and makes you think. OK, because if you start to yeah. think, you may start to question authority. And we don't want that here. You just need enough information yeah. to know how to run the machinery. And one of the things that's cool about what you're doing, and I really enjoyed your podcast. I saw it on the um, on your website there. And what David and I are trying to do on Notes from an Artist, and some of our colleagues, our peers, namely uh, guys like Guy Pratt and Martin Kemp, who do more of a pop thing uh, from the UK, Rock on Tours, it's entitled, is now that because we have a podcast, now it's coming from the ground up. It's almost a Howard Zinn's People's History type thing. Where we're, we are coming from the roots and actually talking to people who were in the room, it's not some writer or some professor telling you from the top down how it is. And your experience as a podcaster, I mean, you're finally setting the record straight on a lot of misconceptions about what jazz is, what jazz should be, and what jazz is not. So it is the best I, of times. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, and it's I, I like I said I really enjoyed listening to it. Trying to do the same. I'll thing. just never ride a fucking subway again, Matt. Thank you yeah, very thank much. You. Well, that part was <laughs> <That's> your fault. <ball. laughs> but but <laughs> seriously, we've had on the show. We've had and we'll have you back on. We've had Ron Carter on a few times. We've had uh, Gary Carr. We've had Tim Byrne. We've had Rudy Sarzo from Ozzy Osbourne's band. We've had Carmen Rojas, who's done everybody from uh, Lavelle to to uh, David Bowie. We've had uh, Richard Thompson on. And, you know, and it's all beautiful. Yeah. And it's all about the big M. It's not about some professor says music uh, should be. How has that podcast? How has that been a, an experience for you being able to just talk uncensored? Well, my, my biggest regret is that I just have run out of time. Yeah. Uh, and I haven't done an episode now for, for a few months. And from what I've read, so, so many podcasts are launched and then don't make 10 episodes. And, uh, you know, I had big plans. I wrote out, I, I wrote out like something like 40 or 50 ideas that I wanted to do. And I haven't given up on it. I just don't have the time. Goodness. And, uh, between my, and, and I also, I'm so into visual art right now that uh, my creative impulse is really got me in the time that I have available. I'm currently obsessed with colors. Like uh, this is this is the one I'm working on right now. Oh, look at that! Nice. I have this thing going on with uh, with color, and I'm trying to figure out ways to uh, combine my visual art and my musical world and. Uh, but I have this currently unable to uh, get away from my, my my creative drive to do these paintings. It's just like, mm. and I just, so the podcast is, is there. I really want to do it. But at the moment, the, the visual art is is kind of winning the game that, that's always going on inside my head. Because I have to work on music every day. And I only, sometimes I only have like two hours tops a day to work on this stuff. So, but I... The, the podcast is like what you guys are doing is so important, I, you know, and, and, and I, I have I have a lot to say about a lot of stuff. That's that's for sure. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. It's on the same theater. Well, I mean, when you came to New York in 1993, I mean, the world, the music world was run by record labels, the major yeah. labels in the indies. And of course, the indie labels did a lot of the heavy lifting, whether it was jazz, rock, experimental, spoken word, folk. And, and now we have streaming where you can reach an audience. There's no gatekeepers anymore. What What are your thoughts on the whole, the, the streaming platform as it is? I mean, we never imagined this would happen in 1993 in yeah. New York City. Is it the best of times? Is it the worst of times? My own experience, I would say the worst. And that's mm -hmm. and that's because I worked at Tower Records in Lincoln Center for maybe oh. 10 years during well, you, the day. You sold me some records, then you sold me some records. Yeah. So I was directly involved with it when CDs were still king. And uh, there was none of this digital stuff. This was before iPads, before right, Napster, yeah. ripping and all that. And as a jazz musician during that time, I was able to be part of at the very tail end, the end of a time when uh, you were, you could expect to record and get a $1,000 mm -hmm. for a recording. You could tour and sell your CDs. There was labels that had a lot more financial backing, if you will. But mm -hmm. there there was a lot more musicians during that time that could actually work by recording. You know, you get hired as a sideman, you work over here, you do a tour over here. There was enough money coming in based around that culture with CDs that you could function. And I was at the tail end of that. So I got to experience that for a few years and then boom. Next thing you know, Tower Records went bankrupt. I lost that, and I lost my job, of course. <laughs> and now we're in the streaming thing, man. It's like it's not it's not all bad. I mean, I, I something like Bandcamp is actually really cool. I, I I love Bandcamp, and I'm like a million other musicians, but but Bandcamp allows me to actually have creative control, and I put my stuff out there, and if. People, you know, it's 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 on me. It's just between it's just me and the public now. And if people buy a CD, I get a I get a fair percentage. So if someone buys a CD for ten dollars, I get I'll get seven. Or buy some buys a download. Someone mm -hmm. buys a download <laughs> for ten, I'll get seven. And uh, I've recorded for a, a lot of different labels over the years. Even even now in the streaming era, I still work with record labels uh, primarily. So that that that's kind of a different position to be in too right unseen right. right records and you know right i i did a cd for silk Heart, a cd for esp okay. and i've and i've done a lot of records for uh unseen rain and unseen rain has been really good to me right and uh, i'm really good friends with with the unseen rain guys and they're great musicians too and they put out great you videos know? their video uh their video page on youtube is phenomenal great stuff yeah yeah, and, 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 and thanks to Unseen Rain, it's definitely a still, from my perspective, a record label is still the way to do it rather mm. than uh, just do it on your own. I've got two, I've, I've got a side band camp where I just put out my own stuff that's not, it's nothing like a fully produced band record, oddball stuff that might not really make it, might mm -hmm. not be enough for a label or, or it's a, or it's a, you know, a, a recording from 10 years ago that never made it out, this kind of right, thing. Or, right, right. Well, you did like that. Ar archival stuff. You did that to your dad, that uh, very poignant. You wrote a nice little piece about your father who passed, I think, yeah. Yeah, earlier this year. And yeah, that, was, that was on, yeah, yeah, I heard that on Bandcamp, you yeah. know. Oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah stuff, stuff like that, you know, like part of my thing has always been recognizing and uh, doing tributes to musicians that I spent time with that have passed on. And then and, and the mm. last... In the last four or five years, it has just been absolutely savage, just brutal. Like so many people, musicians I know have, have passed on, and uh, yeah, life is forever. A lot of them, yeah, and a lot of them are are great musicians that never really got much attention. Mm. And uh, I try to, and and the, the the whole like like streaming culture, phone culture, everything is just every everything in life is just swipe to the left. Everything is just scroll, scroll, <laughs> scroll, swipe to the left, swipe to the left. So no matter what's going down, people can look at it, but then all they got to do is is go like this, and right. whatever it is, just moves on down the river. It's like nothing's permanent anymore. I try to drop things into that stream that might take root or at least get people to pause and look for a few minutes before they swipe again. My, my buddy Francois Griot was a great bass player. You know, he passed away. And, uh, you know, I found I found a CDR of, of, of Francois and I playing duets. I was like, 
Okay, I threw that up on Bandcamp, you know, mo- mostly because it just says, even though it's streaming culture, it, it also says Francois was here. <laughs> exactly, yes. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. he gave yeah. his entire life to music. He was here. He was great. And uh, I know it's time to see what's happening on the next page, but I just want to, I try to do things that will be permanent, even though the culture seems to no longer be. That's one of the reasons I record so much and why I'm painting and, and, and podcasts too. Podcast is like, you know, this, this gets recorded. It will exist. And the way technology is, is, is in our lives right now, 200 years from now, I don't see any reason why something like our conversation right here probably won't be, somebody will be able to find that. <laughs> <laughs> it'll right. right. It'll bounce around the universe. Yeah. You know, unless, unless we all do everything we can to actually destroy it, you know, it's we're, like, we're, we're doing a pretty good job of that. You know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it'll or, or like, like a painting too, you know, uh, once you do it, you know, as long as you take care of it, it's forever. Unless somebody puts it in the trash, you know? Yeah. And, you know, sometimes when you're driving, you know, you're driving around or walking around in the city anywhere, you see, you see trash on the street, you'll see, sometimes you'll see paintings, you know? Oh, I pick them up all the time, yeah. You know, sometimes they're good, sometimes they're not. You know, it's like, sometimes they just didn't make the cut. I mean, we can't, we can't save all of the art, right? But, uh, like, and you guys like to digress, and uh, just a quick digression right here is Please. that uh, I, uh, I had a gig in a, in an art museum and they had a they had a small ancient Egypt section, and I was checking out some of this stuff. And, and I looked at one of the I looked at one of the one of the pieces, and I looked up closely at it, and the artwork sucked. <laughs> <laughs> because we've seen masterful Egyptian art. There's okay. ton, there's there's tons of it, but this yeah. piece right here, when you look at it, whoever the artist was, the face was wrong, the mm-hmm. eyes were wrong, the proportions were wrong. It was essentially like a mistake. If it was an art school, it would have been like they would have given the given the artist like a C. Be like, uh-huh. okay, this is good, but your proportions are wrong. This eye, it, you know, it just it didn't work. And I loved it because what I realized was is that back in, in ancient Egypt, we we know about these exalted great figures and this incredible culture and everything that you know we see everything that's beautiful. Here was something that was that was just it sucked. They were human too. Yes, is, is, right. <laughs> it was my whole thing. They were human too. Like they did all these incredible, you know, sculptures and incredible hieroglyphics and giant walls and everything. And those are those are masterpiece accomplishments that have stood the time of, of thousands of years. Right. But at the time, there was somebody trying to do something, and it didn't work. <laughs> but they, but he was trying. Well, it wasn't a masterpiece. But I, I liked I liked encountering the human side. Right. The of, outtakes, right? The of, yeah. of that culture when all we when all we know is is how great they are, and I and of course I'm celebrating how how great they are. I also want to see the correlation between they were human beings and so are we. I tend to even if, whether it's my art or my music or podcasts or whatever, I I tend to not necessarily remove all the mistakes. I might have a clip note on trumpet. You could have the tech. We have the technology now to go in and pull oh, out course, yeah. a millisecond. Yes. You know, I, I I could go in and pull out all my mistakes, but I don't. I mean, you can you you leave can them hear. in. They're not mistakes. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> and you know, Lee Morgan. Every now, Lee Morgan is 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 one of my you know one of my all time favorites. You know, he had he had good days and bad days too on the on the trumpet. Mm. You know, Miles Miles had Miles had good days and bad days on the trumpet too. You know, we're all we're all human. Yeah, that is well, except for Whitten Marsalis because I don't think I've ever heard him make a mistake. <laughs> I mean, I'll give it to him on that. As a trumpet player, I don't think I have ever heard him clip a note. Every now and then, you could tell what he's he he might he might be starting to run out of air, but he doesn't, and he never will. As a and as a trumpet player, gotta give it up to to his his trumpet okay. chops. The technique. You know, he's like the Michael Jordan of chops on on trumpet, man. Come on. It's like, uh, but now I've digressed into like four or five different things. Well, no, so. on that thread. Um... <laughs> You know, let's raise let's raise the ante. You talk about humanity. What do you, what are your thoughts on what's happening now with artificial intelligence really emerging in culture? I follow this one blo- of YouTube. The name of his uh, YouTube page is Nothing Is Real, and what he does is he AI's the Beatles. He'll take John Lennon, John Lennon's voice, and put it on a new Paul McCartney song. He'll take Paul McCartney and put his song, put his voice on someone else's song. And I've got to tell you, you listen to this stuff, and it's it's pretty, it's mind boggling. And now AI is is going to be part of our daily life, just like streaming and Zoom, which we're on now. Yeah. What about AI and jazz? Can that be can that be done? For me, I am not. Fe- 
feeling AI at any level. I'm, I'm a purist. I want to hear the sound of a of the human voice coming from the person in the room. I, you know, the, the, the well, way, you know, the uh, same the same argument could be made about electric instruments, right? Because I'm sure somebody, no. when the electric bass came along. In our lifetime, David, when the electric, that, that that thing, that beast of an instrument right back there, somebody said, no, acoustic bass, that's coming through electricity. That's not a bass. That's not a bass, yeah. Jocko. That's no, not but a bass there's a difference thing. between yeah. you or I playing something like that live versus right, but, but the ideology, doing it in the AI. Right, right. Yeah. But, and but you also have a really broad way of looking at AI. Yes. You think a synthesizer is AI, and technically you're right, but... It's different than I take uh, Hoagy Carmichael's lyrics to Stardust, put it in chat GPT and do, what would Kanye's lyrics be to this? That's, well, that's you, yeah. the AI that I'm thinking But about. it's a tool, that's don't you it. think? I mean, suppose, um, and we'll talk, uh, since everybody knows who the Beatles are, suppose Ringo and Paul got together and said, hey, let's make a Beatles song, and they AI George and John. Well, they already did. It's called Fly Like... Um, well, but you know what I mean. You're right, right. But, but, but no, what's the point? That that's the thing. Yeah. Where is the point of this? We we've become so. Look at Taylor Swift and and Auto Tune and all this other bullshit. Yeah, but that's it, yeah, it, right. You're looking it, at the mainstream. They, they pop, started yeah. out as tools, but then now they're the thing, and that's yeah. bullshit. <laughs> well, don't get Tom. Don't, you're wrong. I, Tom, you to, ignorant you, slut. Well, you're man, wrong. Can't we put Can't we put Thundercat and Ornette together? I mean, no. No, we you can't. know what it is. I I'm sure that generationally, there are people that will young people that will come up and find a creative way to use AI. Of course, and, they will. Yes, and they'll become a. They might even become a genre, and they'll be doing yeah. live shows. Yeah, and uh, but you know, will they be live? Well, well that's but, the thing. But I go back to hip hip hop and rap sampling jazz. They removed an organic element. And found a creative way to use it. Right, Roy Hargrove and, did that with his uh, P, a pH, right, or whatever P factor, or whatever Roy Hargrove factor. Yeah, or something. yeah. I mean, that's kind of, that, that's kind of where this kind of thing started. Yeah. If you if you sample something on Blue Note and then you remix it and put it into a hip hop rap thing, it's cool. But you've also taken some of the organic nature out of it. Now, now AI is now now it has the potential to completely remove. The organic aspect of it but from their perspective those people will say that that actually is not or that's the opposite of the case they'll actually somehow feel this because it's because it's part of our reality right now right they'll see it as an organic human kind of thing to create using tools you know i it's not for me but in particular yeah. not for me because my first mentor was from the swimming era. My first mentor was Hildred Humphreys, and this guy played with Billy Holiday. And I'm like, that's where my whole that's where my whole thing starts. And I don't and and for me personally, I don't care how many times they remix Billy Holiday, they will never ever through AI or technology get a million miles within Billy Holiday singing a song about her man cheating on her yes. and having the vibe come through from her soul and her sound. Great point, you know. Great is point. is is I don't care how <laughs> hip and interesting AI uh, AI does AI can merge Sarah Vaughan, Billie Holiday, and Ella Fitzgerald into some kind of super singer that's greater than all the other singers. I don't. No matter what they do, they are for for me. They they. I mean, and and I would. That's where I would draw my line in the sand. I, they will never get anything right. close to the humanity of that that moment from from my perspective. Right, from your perspective, yes. <laughs> and uh, Tom, you're just wrong. That's all well. There is look, to it's you. not to, not to say that I'm going to AI Jocko or uh, Sir Paul or anybody like that. But well, you... the, well, well, one of the worst things that I've seen is is is, is a robot that plays Trains Giant Step solo. They they hooked up a tenor saxophone to a <laughs> robot and they programmed it to play the Giant Step solo. It's on right. YouTube. And now you can watch a robot play Trains Giant Steps solo. I mean, right. and, and why? Just because we can, on some level, I mean, and this might sound like I'm an egomaniac or whatever, but some, on some, on some level for me, it's a cop out. It's a cop out. You're going to use these tools to create some new shit, but why can't you just create some new shit by yourself with you as the source? Like right. my, my tools, my tools are paint. My tools are, 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 are trumpet and words. You can, you know, we, you guys are, you guys are right, musicians, right? Writers, we, podcast. Words is, is, 
words are the are the tools, you know, like, and, and we, we're the source of this stuff. I mean, but at the same time, I can't find, I used to use Grammarly. Of course, I, yeah. I use yeah. Grammarly like uh, when I was writing papers at, 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 at Rutgers, yeah, I'd do a grammar check. <laughs> Of course, that was a, that was a blessing in disguise. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Word processing, it was called back. I can't front on the on the use of uh, uh, that these tools can can that they can absolutely have beneficial use to us in lots of different things in life. Now, using them as art, I would say I'll let I'll let uh, I'll let history judge. Yeah, <laughs> no, I'll let well, history be the judge. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, when they get a robot to play Ornette Coleman and things like that, or, or whomever. <laughs> Giant steps. Yeah, I mean, that's a bit of the sensational aspect of it. But uh, AI is another tool in the box, whether we like it or not. But there's something interesting about taking giant steps, for instance, because when you have a robot doing it, how many kids are in college, either Berkeley or um, University of Texas, who have to go through the process of learning giant steps? The, the emotion's gone in so many cases anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah we're going to do this. We're going to do this. Oh, we're going to go up a major third. Oh, we're going to do this here. I mean, <laughs> Slansky, <laughs> go home. <laughs> Gi- giant, steps, man. giant steps is worthy of an entire episode of a podcast, if not a series. Oh, uh, a podcast of, unloaded unto itself, yeah. Of all yeah. the parameters and things all drilled down to that to that piece, man. It's, it's Matt, I wrote a book um, for bass players called um, The Three Tonic System. And basically the whole concept was to be able to manipulate giant steps. So what? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it looked like a good idea while COVID was going on. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, yeah, you might you might dig this, man. My friend, my friend Daniel Carter went up uh, in the seventies. He went to Miles' house and knocked on his door, and uh, Miles actually answered the door, but didn't say nothing. So Daniel said, "Well, you know," he told him he was a musician, told him his whole story, how much Miles' music meant to him. Miles just listened, and then Miles looked at him and he said two words. <laughs> So what? <laughs> and then he closed the door and went back inside. So <laughs> yeah, it's you know, funny that you mentioned Daniel because <laughs> when you're talking about people who play trumpet and wind instruments, Daniel's like one of the best. As a matter of fact, he was on um, my first Theorcalus record. Man, when you say there are a few masters who can do that. Daniel's one of them. I really enjoyed listening to that record, man. At, at first, I was perplexed because because DC's thing is usually not to to he plays he's usually totally free. And then I heard a trumpet and an alto or a trumpet and a bass clarinet playing these lines. Yeah, that was patience. And I was, and, and I was and I was I was like, but then I looked at the at the personnel and I saw how it went down. So yeah. DC, DC was able to be himself in that environment, which was like a different kind of environment than he's usually in. It was very cool, man. And you also, man, you had the great Will Connell, man. <laughs> oh, Will Con- one man. of the sweetest men on the planet, right? I mean, man, Will is, is uh, in fact, a friend of mine, I, I want to do like a, a tribute record to Will, Jeremy Carlstedt. And uh, Will was such a beautiful guy, man. And Will is one of those guys that, that I was like, I was talking about earlier. Will left the planet. It's like, this is a big, this is, this, this is a big deal for, for, for creative people, man. Will Connell was very special beautiful artist and human being and so many people have passed on recently you know will is like a name on the list but will was really uh what a, what a great guy what a beautiful guy man. yeah we would talk music oh we were on the phone for hours just talking about music and his playing is just exemplary yeah. just beautiful beautiful playing and his, his bass clarinet on that on on, on your record is, is very strong very concise yeah yeah. And there's not that many recorded examples of his of of Will's bass clarinet. You know, there's some yeah. YouTube stuff, but uh, he was criminally under under recorded. And uh, whereas DC, uh, DC is one of my best friends, and 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 he has not been criminally under recorded. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. This yeah, is true. He man, DC is is going to go down in history as one of the probably most recorded uh, free improv musicians ever. Yeah, but yeah. you know it, it. What's interesting, and we were talking with Cisco about this too. Tom, you remember we were talking about the the fact that free musicians are some of the most entrepreneurial cats. And when you look at Daniel, one of the things that's so important, the reason he's so 
well recorded is because he's out there. It doesn't matter if it's a punk band, if it's a rock band or anything. Daniel just wants to play and it makes a great deal of sense. And he's a great cat too. For for any Daniel Carter aficionados that might watch that might uh, watch this episode. I did, I've done some duos with Daniel, but I did something very different from his usual stuff where I made a record where I only played piano and DC played through his whole, uh, his, his whole arsenal. Now I'm not a, I'm not a official pianist, but I practiced uh, for months specifically to create these things for him. And that would give him uh, a way for him to deal with harmony that he doesn't usually get to do in, in totally free stuff, but that would mm-hmm. work for him. And it's a very unique Daniel Carter record. It's on my Bandcamp page. Okay. And uh, I forget what I called it. But if, if anybody looks up my name on We'll look it up and play it. We'll play it, Trent. We'll play it. Yeah, well, that's the other thing. We're going to play some stuff from Housekeeper because that's a great record. That's your latest record so far, correct? Yeah. So we'll do something from that. We'll do something from some of your earlier stuff, too. Uh, We'll play some Wynn Marsalis. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. Of the way jazz should be played, man. Yeah, well, well, after we AI it, of course. Yes. (laughs) Actually, yeah, Kanye playing Wynn Marsalis. That's what we'll do. If you actually go there with Wynn, man, I can tell you the record to play. Go, let's uh, go. With all due respect, man. Live from the House of Tribes. He man, he plays some shit on that record, man. I, for me, that is his greatest. All right, David. Greatest we gotta right give, we gotta get the jazz police um, you know, some credit. And specifically his solo on Green Chimneys. This is okay. some sh- this as someone who's played for, as as a Don Cherry acolyte and someone that's okay. played with Ornette and all that, I give it up to Winton on that Green Chimneys. That Green Chimney solo is a so-and-so. And the all solo right, yeah, okay. we got to play it. It's in the set list. Uh, I wrote it down. We'll do it. We'll do it. <laughs> we'll just play bass clarinet and and um, trumpet music for the whole show. So, yeah, it'll, there'll be some good stuff there. Yes, the ratings will go up, and I'm sure the downloads will increase. <laughs> yes, anyway. Cool, so cool. Well, Matt, thanks for being our guest. We'll let you know when this airs. And of course, everything's on the podcast. What else, David? Any other tracks we want to ask Matt if he'd like us to play? Oh, yeah. No, it's, no, no. We'll, we'll get some good stuff. And I'll go on the Bandcamp page and, and pick some stuff as well. There's a, if, if there's one, uh, one thing that I would uh, ask to, to throw in there, it would be something from my uh, my my orchestra to 12 Houses. I've had a big band for, I've had my own version of a, of a big band now for more than 10 years. And we just recorded two CDs worth of material for our label, uh, Mahakala Music. And that's going to come out in the spring of, of, of next year. But this really is my my, my life's work. It's, it's my, okay. it's, I did this thing called, uh, I did a piece called The Crop Circle Suite. Part mm-hmm. one. This this is like my my own skies of America. I've I've I, I worked on it for years and years, and it finally happened uh, recently thanks to Chad Fowler, who's a great musician at uh, Mahakala Music. So that stuff's not available yet, but there is Twelve Houses stuff available on YouTube and on Bandcamp. Yeah, there is okay, stuff, okay. There is stuff to check out. By the way, I saw the original performance of Skies of America at Carnegie Hall when I was a kid. Ooh. Wow, man. Wow. That was a trip. Wow. And this is the man you've become today. That's what it's is that <laughs> Was that Skies meets Primetime or Skies? No, it was the original It had to be the original. Skies. It was just Ooh. with the orchestra. The American Ooh. flag on the record, right? That's that's the record. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. Oh, man. Well, I'll tell you, to be a, to, that's uh, an incredible thing to experience live, man. Wow. Yeah, it, it, it certainly did change my, my, my life and the way I think. Uh, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. I ended up playing with Sonny Chirac after that. So wow. that was 19 years old and completely green. But, but what, what great experiences. Man, Sonny uh, Chirac, man. Yeah. That's, uh, have you guys done an episode on Sonny? Not yet. No, we have not. You know, we, we've been, we're trying to get all the live musicians yeah. we can. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know, appreciate uh, that. I appreciate that too. <laughs> we'll definitely get to Sonny. We'll get definitely get to him. Yeah. All right, Matt, we'll let you know when this airs and we'll send you all the links and everything else. Well, you guys rock. And I just I just say real quick, I really appreciate it. I've always I almost did a Facebook post a few months ago a few months ago, but like, how come nobody wants to interview me, man? I got all kinds of I've seen a lot of things. I've I've got, you know, nobody wants to, you know, but but you guys, you guys you know, we we just did it. So I we found just, it. So I, well once once the I appreciate pot- it. 
once the podcast is up on, um, you know, it's on everything. It's on Spotify, Buzzsprout, wherever podcasts are potted, exploit it, send it out. Oh, man, believe me, I will be sending it far and wide. <laughs> cool, cool. All right. Okay, be hey, well, Good Matt. to meet you, Matt. We'll see you when you're in New York. All right, take okay. care. Go Phillies. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Peace. Well, how about that? Fascinating I think we, stuff. Yeah, I think we learned quite a lot. And Matt, can't wait to see you in New York playing. But please, we implore you, Pat Stakes, cheese wit, okay? Right. And no more rooting for the Sixers or the Flyers. And uh, check out our playlist, our Matt Laval playlist on our podcast. We um, really traverse his career. Amazing stuff with Matt. He's done stuff with William Parker. He's done stuff with his Our Melodic Monk Ensemble. Really, really great stuff. The 12 Houses Orchestra. So listen to our podcast, which you can find on Apple Amazon, Buzz, Sprout, Spotify, and wherever podcasts are potted. And thanks for being a guest, Matt, and we will have you back soon. Absolutely. And guys, we'll see you next week. Take care. Ta-ta. 